I'd like to think that well-funded publishers can still pull off something creative and risky with their money. The crew is creative and risky, and it's a concept that only a AAA game could have pulled off. It's an ambitious project where a lot of things could have gone wrong, and unfortunately they did go wrong. It tells a familiar story about hubris, over-budgeting, and outsourcing spoiling an excellent idea. It's the strangest and most bizarre, conventional mainstream game I've played all year. It's a teetering balance of conflicting, half-baked ideas that all quickly toppled over each other. The Crew, not to be confused with The Crew, The Crew, or The Crew, is a moderately multiplayer online car PG that takes place in a massive sandbox map designed to look like the entire continental United States. From the Canadian border to the Mexican border, New York to LA, the swamps of Louisiana, the Bonneville Salt Flats, the Chihuahuan Desert, the Lake Pontchartrain Bridge, it's all there and you don't even need to stay on the road to see it all. So naturally, if you live in the States, the first thing you're probably going to do is compare this map to the real thing. So Atlanta should be right around here, which is Chattanooga, and it's just a few miles inland from Daytona Beach, Florida. Okay. That map is what got me interested. It's adorable. It's like they took all the boring parts of the United States and tried to mush the rest of it back together good enough to still hold shape. It's about 80 miles across instead of 3,000, and that's why you can see Miami Beach from space. That's adorable. Granted, pretty much everything on this map looks pretty bad if you slow down to check it out, but I found the idea of it very appealing. After all the bloodshed and violence of most games, I was looking forward to a more peaceful experience, just driving around the countryside with some friends. The crew is not that, though. The crew actually has a story mode, where you play as this scruffy-looking trucker guy named Alex. You avenge your brother's murder by going undercover to infiltrate criminal gangs across the country, and you do this by driving cars around really fast. I don't really see the thematic connection between this game's story and its gameplay, and maybe I shouldn't even bother trying to look for it. I mean, Driver San Francisco had you playing as the dream of a ghost cop who fights crime by magically possessing people's cars, and after experiencing that, it feels like anything could happen. But instead of anything weird or fun or self-aware or even entertaining, we get some kind of derivative macho big dick revenge fantasy. And why does the FBI's map of America look like this, but our map looks like this? It's all fluff. It has little to nothing to do with the game, and it tries to make us believe in this strange, bizarro world where homicidal gang leaders settle their differences through cross-country rally races. It makes no sense, and it commits the horrible sin of not having fun with itself while making no sense. And it really does have nothing to do with the game. You'll have story missions where characters who are in no hurry just want to give you a quiet tour of the town. And then suddenly dramatic action music will blare while timers count down your race to the next checkpoint. There may be no harm in skipping all those cutscenes and phone calls. You'll actually get a much better idea of what this game's about from the multiplayer login menu. This screen calls this game what it actually is, a drive hub. It's not a personal quest for vengeance. It's a drive hub, a giant hub world with hundreds of diverse driving challenges with a long list of time-consuming unlockables and a high enough skill ceiling to keep players hooked for at least a few weeks. That's the idea. You play with anywhere from 30 to 50 other players who seamlessly connect and disconnect from your session as you drive around this map completing whichever challenges unlock points towards the next thing you want to play with. Story missions give you experience points that you spend on perks, a lot of which are oddly designed to make that leveling go faster. Skill challenges are a quick way to earn new and better parts for your cars, and the faction missions have you doing a lot of cross-country races that can last up to two hours at a time. And those are the money makers. They are what earn you the big bucks. That's the actual word for currency in this game, by the way. Bucks. If they called them dollars, players might get them confused with the real-life exchange rate for crew credits. Or, as I like to call them, Ubisoft Uplay Fun Bucks. You can lay down real bucks for fun bucks, which of course have more purchasing power than bucks, and can also be used to buy just about anything. Thankfully, most unlockables can be quickly attained if you focused on the faction missions. However, those perk points you get after leveling up cannot be bought with bucks. 
They can be bought with fun bucks. In fact, you can fun buck your way past the designed level cap, past the point where you will no longer be leveling and can no longer get any more of those points legitimately. It gives an unquestionable advantage to the players who pay up, and this just damages the idea that an alternate currency scheme like this should ever exist in a full price title, especially since so much of this game is about its competitive multiplayer aspect. If you're taking it seriously, you're going to want every advantage you can get. That's because driving is surprisingly demanding in the crew. It takes a weird middle ground between feeling arcadey and feeling like a simulator. It's easy enough to drive a nice, fast, smooth line, but any time you have to turn, the game suddenly turns on hard mode. Figuring out exactly when, where, and how to brake is something I never really got used to, even after 30 hours, so being able to really learn the handling here might take you who knows how long. Either way, the game seems to want you to sacrifice a lot of speed to make these turns, so the game's handling is giving you all sorts of weird mixed messages. On one hand, you've got to take turns slowly and carefully, but during all other times, you've got to be really putting your foot down to keep up. Granted, I'm not super experienced with racing games, but I could never really tell if I got the hang of this one, because the opponent AI is only as competent or incompetent as the player is. If you've ever hated rubber band AI in a racing game before, then god, th this game just takes it to a whole new level. The AI racers don't just do a way better job of hitting those turns than you, they also recover from crashes, weave through traffic, and speed out of the dirt faster than you do. They'll either rocket past you or humbly give you first place, depending on what the game seems to think is more exciting. The police chases really show just how much of a crapshoot the AI difficulty is. They'll either teleport closer to fugitive players, or just run around in circles, accomplishing absolutely nothing. The AI and the sloppy handling are two crippling issues to what is still an overwhelmingly unpolished game. They contribute nail-biting frustration to features and design decisions that are just bizarre. For example, check out how the fast travel works. You can fast travel to literally any speck of dirt you've been on before, as well as about a quarter mile radius around it. Which means you can fill in the map by teleporting in increments of how long your map fill distance is. And that just gives you no reason to drive anywhere and explore it for yourself. Also, you get 2,000 bucks for clicking on these landmark icons, which is weird on one level because who's giving you this money and why, but on another level because it's an effortless way to farm bucks. If you have money problems, all you have to do is just teleport to one landmark after another. You'll be making lots of money for no effort whatsoever, and that's not fun. The car upgrading system is also really weird. You level up different classes of cars with different pieces of parts. It's like a stand-in for the classes and equipment of an RPG. Instead of being a level 45 blood mage, you're a level 45 circuit Chevy Corvette. And when you beat someone's track record in the middle of the woods miles from civilization, you'll win a level 42 air conditioner, at which point you can equip it. Right there, on the spot, in the middle of the woods. Or you can send it back to HQ for later, which may or may not allow you to equip it onto a different car. It's hard to tell, and that folds into the big problem of the game's interface. It's both vague and intrusive at the same time, which is exactly what an interface shouldn't be. You have to click through a whole lot of pop-up menus constantly slapping onto the screen. And if you want to customize parts, you have to fast travel to actual geographic locations very far away and wait through multiple loading screens and cutscenes to get to the menus that may or may not explain what happened to that level 42 air conditioner. Meanwhile, the metagame, the endgame, the PvP game, whatever you want to call it, is structured as a persistent multiplayer unlocking competition. Story missions earn you XP for perks. Short skill challenges get you parts. Lengthy faction races get you money. Money buys cars, parts level them up, and it seems like the entire point of the process is just a never-ending grind to put bigger and better numbers on bigger and better cars. I seriously wonder how long players can keep that up, considering the amount of content currently available. Like I said earlier, the idea is to keep players hooked for at least a few weeks. You can tell because there are slots built into the menus for rotating weekly and monthly challenges. During launch week, we had the Comcast Xfinity Speed Challenge and... Jesus Christ. The crew compromises, settles, and pedals. Even without the product placement and the microtransactions, it would still be an underwhelming experience. 
which is a shame because it could have been so much more. The size, scale, and diversity of that map creates an experience that you just won't get in any other game, and it has its own special moments because of that. Those coast-to-coast -coast two hour races are incredible endurance matches that end with an absolutely thrilling final stretch where even placing third feels like a huge accomplishment. Believe it or not, time flies while you're doing those things. They don't feel like they last two hours because time flies when you're having fun. But on your way there, you will witness the AI cheat its way in and out of first place. You'll see your cars spin out from sloppy handling, you'll see unpredictable traffic and minor obstacles careening you off the path. You might even be unlucky enough to have the game crash or kick you off to the main menu. I like to call moments like that a Ubisoft Uplay fun break. You probably won't believe this, but I actually recommend this game, but only as a dirt cheap bargain bin buy after it goes on sale for less than $10, because it feels like a budget game. I, I think. It's actually really hard to tell. There are these slick pre-renders telling this stupid story, there's a top 40s pop soundtrack of licensed hits you've already heard a lot of before, and the cars are licensed from the real world too. But the game looks and plays so much cheaper than those elements would suggest. It's a really bizarre mishmash of barely working ideas that spoil the fun of a great idea. But that fun is still in there somewhere. Which is why I think it would make a good budget pickup to check out for a day or two. There's a lot of rewarding thrills to be had on this map, particularly the off-road cross-country races, where the game can give you a lot more room for maneuvering and the AI isn't so keen on cutting corners. It feels great to be able to think about and say and experience a race from Miami to LA, but all the little frustrations you have to deal with on your way there show a remarkable lack of thought, attention, and polish applied to this game. The idea is great, the execution is terrible, and the $60 product is just not worth your hard-earned bucks.